just to, to give you the kind of medical definitions, early miscarriages happen within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. And what is in, in medical terms called late miscarriages, make, late miscarriage happens between 12 and 24 weeks. But obviously the further on um, in pregnancy that a loss occurs, it can feel more like a stillbirth or the loss of a preterm baby. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have three children who are now in their teens and twenties, but my interest in miscarriage um, follows the loss of 14 pregnancies when I was in the early stages of pregnancy. So I suffered from recurrent miscarriage. And at the time I was completely convinced that it wasn't just nature's way. Um, I'm sure that there was an underlying condition at the root of the problem. And so I got involved in Tommy's um, fundraising initially, and now I work with the charity. And Tommy's is one of the biggest, uh, one of the five biggest funders into pregnancy research. So my hope is that um, one day, but before my children start their own families, um, miscarriage care and treatment will be a totally different picture to what I experienced. And I think, you know, recent research findings are really starting to show that we can no longer regard miscarriage as just one of those things or nature's way. So this evening we have Hayley Fury, who is a specialist um, registrar in OBS and Gynae at a currently based at John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. And we have Anna Nella, who is a bereavement specialist midwife at Guy's and St Thomas's. But first of all, just to set the scene, um, we are going to hear from Margaret Hayes, who's kindly going to share her experience of the baby. Yes, that's Margaret, to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail of what happened because I am conscious of time. Um, I don't know, I'm getting nervous, but I think... I'm getting nervous well because it brings me back to what happened if I'm honest. So if anybody's lost a baby, they'll know that it, just, it sticks with you. It never goes away and you get flashbacks. I think you just learn how to deal with the pain rather than forget about what happens. And that's in my case, what happened um, and what is happening, I should say. Um, so well, I'm gonna go back to 2019. Um, we were trying for a baby um got pregnant uh it was an amazing surprise um i was expecting three months after a really close friend of mine and was also expecting and then um just didn't think anything of it in terms of anything going wrong i knew people use babies or miscarried and stuff like that but i was i was trying to not take my mind there and i would always do my affirmations every single day about carrying my baby to full term and it would be healthy um, and it, I remember just constantly getting pressure and pain um, in basically in my womb area or vagina area. Um, and I just dismissed it as because I'd never got so far before in pregnancy. Um, so I just dismissed it as one of those things. Um, and I had also in the past, I had a cervical uh so cervical cells removed and, and uh, the hospital I was seeing at the time wanted to measure my cervix but decided not to because they contacted St Thomas's and St Thomas's told them that I, I didn't have much removed so they dismissed measuring my cervix and um, I and allowed me to progress with my pregnancy really um, so uh, we got to I think about 15 weeks as the pain was getting worse and I remember saying to one of my friends did you get anything like this and she said no nope, not at all um also I forgot to mention there's quite a lot actually to this pregnancy that happened but I also fell off the bus and it bled heavily and that was around 13 weeks and I was thinking oh must have lost the baby that was a lot of blood um didn't lose the baby went to the hospital everything was fine no one measured my cervix, no one really checked up and they just said, oh, everything's fine, you know, just come back in a couple of weeks and for your appointments, which I did. But I then decided to speak to one of my friends and just said to her, I'm getting this really annoying pressure 
and it's this heaviness downstairs. Um, I'm really worried about it. And um, also, I don't know if about anybody else, but I was really, because we had been trying for three and a half years, I didn't want to have intercourse, but that week or two before I had intercourse, I was very scared, scared that I was going to lose a pregnancy in that knowing infections can cause it, et cetera. Anyway, I think it was, I think I was, I think it was a Sunday night and I was saying to my friend, I'm getting pressure. And she said, oh gosh, you need to go to the hospital. That doesn't sound good. I said, okay, I'll go. So I'll go tomorrow or go on Tuesday because my appointment's on Tuesday. So I went to, um, went to work as you do, still get, still got that pressure. That was on a Monday. And, um, and then I got out of the shower um, and then I noticed water was coming down my legs and I was, I just started to panic. I said, no, 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 this is too soon. This, I was in my second trimester coming up to 18 weeks and was like, no, 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 this is too soon. Why, why is there water coming down my legs? Um, anyway, uh, water came down my legs. I got on the floor. Um, I'm a Christian. So I prayed and I was like, God, please, please, please do not let this baby be coming now please just let the water stop contacted my friend who it had happened to twice she'd lost two babies 20 weeks and 17 weeks and she said well what you need to do right now is pack your bags you need to go to hospital you're going into labor I was like goodness me anyway the contractions came thick and fast I managed to maintain or be calm to some extent I was in a car, I started getting contractions, they started going on my back, all around, if, uh, everywhere basically. You can imagine if you've had contractions before, it was awful. I got to the hospital, explained what happened or what was going on, and they just said, oh, just take some paracetamol. And I was like, hey, okay, I'll take some paracetamol. Didn't take the paracetamol, but I was like, wow, is that, is that what we're doing? Just recommending paracetamol, okay. So I told my husband to meet me at the hospital because he just finished work. I was really calm. And um, then the contractions were getting worse to the point I couldn't sit on the chair. Um, to the point, and I wanted to start screaming because the pain was getting worse. We finally got seen um, by a lovely doctor and she checked, she brought us into a room which literally was, which was right next to the waiting area in A&E. And she checked down below and her face dropped as though basically blood basically came away from her face. And she, um, she was like, I'm so sorry, but your membranes have ruptured, your cervix, cervix is fully dilated, you're going into labor. And I was like, right, okay. And I just screamed. I didn't care what was outside or who was outside. I screamed and I screamed. And I cried. I felt like I was in an, I felt like I was in a bad dream, a, a nightmare. Um, and I just said, "Is there any way we could stop this?" And she said, "We could do an emergency stitch, um, but that's not guaranteed because of where everything's pretty much opened. You're fully open. Um, this baby's probably going to come. I'm so sorry." Um, and then I saw my husband's face drop, and he was crying, and that was horrible to see because we just lost his mum the year before. Um, and then we stayed in the hospital for a, a few days and um, I wish I could say the treatment of all members of the staff were amazing and supportive but it wasn't um, we went um, do you know what I'm really impressed with myself sorry I have to say this because I'm not crying <laughs> and I managed to get I'm managing to get through this without crying and I'm so so pleased that because I, I just wanted to just give it justice without actually having to stop what I'm trying to say but anyway we I went to the hospital, we stayed in, obviously. We stayed in for about a week. Um, I was really worried about getting sepsis because I know what, um, one of my friends that happened to, she said, if the vagina is open for too long, you can get an infection. We don't want that for the, to happen to you. So we need to try and get, you know, you need to speed up getting this baby out. So um, went downstairs, got scanned the next day, went downstairs, this doctor was scanned me and um, we heard, this baby's heartbeat really strong and moving around and his legs were fluttering down the earth now just doing that and I was like wow like I can't believe this baby's going to die and there's nothing that's going to stop that from happening and he doesn't even know and when I say he we didn't know it was a little boy until he was born um 
but yeah, he doesn't even know what's about to happen to him. And the doctor was just so, I don't know, I feel like she was desensitized or just, yeah, she just was very blank faced and just was like, have you got any questions? And I just said, do I have to stay here to have this baby? And she said, yes, you do. You do have to stay here. And there was no way, I'm sorry that you're going through this. There was nothing. It was just, and I felt ashamed of myself. I felt ashamed of my body. I felt ashamed for going downstairs to even have a scan, knowing that I've had this profound bump because um, I've been pregnant early um, before in the past. And I don't know, my, I had this profound bump. I don't know if that sped up um, me just being able to show early, but I felt embarrassed and ashamed of my body. And anyway, the following day, um, they gave me some injections to speed up labor. He finally came. We, it was very much, um, how can I describe it? I don't, they, there was no sympathy. They literally gave us our son in, um, I don't know, it was like a, um, what do you call it? Something to basically, you vomiting. That's, I can't remember what it's called, but he, they gave, him, gave us our son in this little thing. It was about this size. Um, Obviously, we noticed it was a little boy because he obviously had his private parts. Um, and I just was so, so sad because I just thought nothing was wrong with you. You're healthy, you were forming beautifully and you're here because my cervix just couldn't keep you in. Um, anyway, we went to the doctor again because she was going to remove my placenta. Having tried, another doctor having tried to remove my placenta manually, took it out in bits, it was getting stuck, I was bleeding, I was in pain, it was horrible, it was barbaric, it was just the worst thing. So I found that the same doctor that scanned me um, was going to operate me, operate on me. And I I just cried, I was just, I just didn't want her to touch me because I just thought, you didn't even care when I was at my lowest. And I think she saw me cry because I was like, I don't want that doctor to operate on me. I just don't want, I just don't want her to touch or come anywhere near me. And she saw me cry, floods of tears. And my husband said, well, her face has changed. There's almost something that's happened inside her to make her realize actually she probably feels sorry now. So she operated on me, she removed my placenta and that was that. Um, and I think again, it, that whole shameful attitude of going downstairs, being with other pregnant women who were probably coming into the last term or in the last or the second trimester and with their profound bumps, I'm sure everything was fine. And I just thought, here I am and I've lost my son and there's nothing to show for it. And it was, we stayed there for a week. I'm so glad it happened prior to the pandemic. I don't know if I would have coped. Um, we left the hospital, I had a panic attack. I cried outside um, of the hospital. I said, I went in that hospital with my baby and I'm coming out with nothing. And I just literally cried and cried. I was in the car. I couldn't even sleep on the, my other side of the bed. We did ready to um, change sides because obviously when you're in second trimester, you have to sleep on your left hand side because you're worried about stillborn births, et cetera. So I just, I could, as I said, I can't sleep on the other side. Everything around, even though our son hadn't been born, everything in our house was about our son, our baby. And it was like I was coming back to, I don't know, it was just, it was very eerie. It was horrible. I didn't want to be at home. And I remember telling my boss who I worked for at the time that I needed to take time off. And she said, take some antidepressants. You don't need to take any time off. You just need to keep coming to work. And I said, I can't, I physically can't. I'm crying every day. I, I can't cope. I'm, I'm not able to do my job properly. Um, and I also had my students asking me, oh, miss, what happened to your baby? Blah, blah, blah. And um, it was also embarrassing knowing that I had nothing to show and the bump was growing and I'm coming into work and I can't explain because it's unprofessional about what's happened. Um, anyway, in the end, I decided to take the time. I got occupational health to refer me or they referred me to occupational health. Um, and I took five months off. I didn't know what, how much time I was going to take off, but I knew I needed the time. Um, otherwise, I was going to commit suicide. And that's the honest truth. Um, every day I would hit myself in a shower, just literally hit myself really hard. Um, I contemplated taking tablets. The only thing that stopped me is that I just had to keep well tunnel vision and think, if you 
end it all now, you're going to take away the life your husband would have had with a new a family that you should have had if you end it now. That's what I kept on having in my head, the conviction of it's not going to affect just my husband, but it would affect my family, the rest of my family. And that's what stopped me from committing suicide. But the hitting myself was what I did to take the pain away every single day. And I just felt ashamed and embarrassed. And some people didn't talk to me. Some people chose not to speak to me because I don't know if that was their way of dealing with it. Some people said to me, don't go again quickly because you will probably lose it again. Some people said to me, at least you know you could get pregnant. Just the usual rubbish, to be honest. Um, and I thankfully found I, I was getting counselling with a bereavement midwife at the hospital that I was um, that I had my son at. And she was amazing. And she just said to me, when you get pregnant again, contact a subsequent midwife um, at the new hospital and they will support you in your new pregnancy um, should anything happen or you have any panic attacks or anything like that. Um, I can honestly say, and it might sound really weird, I don't know if anybody can relate to this, after having lost our son, I just wanted to get pregnant again very quickly. I'm not saying that it would have replaced our son, but it would have filled that void because, and in my mind, it would allowed me have allowed me to prepare for that maternity leave that I was actually looking forward to. Um, and it took me three and a half months after, but it was it was a very horrible journey because all my friends who I was pregnant with at the same time went on to have their babies. I couldn't even, and as much as I love their children, if I'm honest, I didn't want to see any babies. Um, I didn't want to see any children. I, I took myself out of groups where people posted their babies because I just thought, I can't see a baby. And I, and I can't believe that you would just casually just send pictures out of your child. And I know that's their right, but I just thought, I'm, I'm, I've lost a child here and you're just, you know, showing your child off. And that's, that's how it affected me. Um, but yeah, I'm going to stop now because there is so much more to the story and I am conscious of time, but um, yeah. That, that's my story. I'm still living through it. I still have flashbacks. I still cry because I just think what a waste of life of a healthy child. He had, he had a post-mortem for him. It came back that an infection had got into my um, cervix and got into the amniotic sac. Um, nothing had touched him. And it turned out that I also had a short cervix that which led to going into premature labor or preterm loss or miscarriage. Um, so yeah, but it turned out that, and, and every day I just think to myself, you know, we've got things in the house, his footprints, his handprints, and we wouldn't have had those things had we not asked and had our friends and not gone through that. So that's my story. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Mark. And I'm so sorry that you went through that such a hard time. And I'm so pleased that you, you now have, I know it doesn't replace you lost, but that you now have a little money to bring joy to, to you and your husband. Thank you. Great. Um, now I'm going to ask Hanine if she can tell us a little bit more about um, what we currently know in terms of the science behind miscarriage and its underlying cause and some of the avenues of research that are underway. Thanks, Kate. Um, so I have got a few slides that I will use just to guide this talk. Um, but I'm very conscious that it's a very big subject um, and I think there's a lot to say about it and, and I do have a lot to say about it but I think I'll, I'll just give us a very brief overview um, about um, pregnancy loss. So um, my background is that I am a um, doctor in obstetrics and gynaecology um, I'm on that pathway to becoming a consultant um, but I took a couple of years out of training to, um, to work specifically in early pregnancy care. I think like Marge explained to us, it's so important to um, have the capacity and, and the space to be able to look after any couples in, in early pregnancy when they have symptoms that are of concern or when indeed they, they lose their babies. Um, the hospital that I worked at was part of um, Tommy's or it, it, it is part of um, Tommy's in terms of being a center for national, um, it's part of the, the National Miscarriage Center. Um, and it's a fantastic, um, a uh, group of hospitals um, with fantastic leaders um, in terms of consultants in miscarriage care um, that have really made uh, fantastic findings in, in recent years. Um, I specifically recruited patients to a um, study looking at predictors of first trimester miscarriage. Um, 
there's many risk factors in for miscarriage. So some of them are um, modifiable. So um, smoking, for example, um, uh, we know that BMI is associated with um, first trimester pregnancy loss and lots of pregnancy complications. Um, but the reason that I'm focusing here specifically on maternal age is that um, there's a lot of guilt that comes in early pregnancy. So um, a lot of the risk factors associated with pregnancy loss are not modifiable. Um, so the majority of patients who have a pregnancy loss before 12 weeks will lose their pregnancy because of genetically abnormal embryo. Um, and the risk of having a trisomy within a pregnancy increases as we get older. Um, so trisomy means having three chromosomes instead of two copies of, of one chromosome number. So a common example would be trisomy 21, Down syndrome. But in first trimester pregnancies, trisomy 16 is actually the most common um, pregnancy, um, the, the most common uh, genetic abnormality in these pregnancies. Um, but these risk factors are not modifiable, and there's nothing that um, couples would do to necessarily increase that risk. And we know that when we talk to women in the first trimester, there's lots of guilt about pregnancy loss. Women always think back at their activities in the last couple of days and weeks and think, have I done something to specifically cause this? And I guess this data reassures us that actually a big proportion of pregnancies will miscarry because of a genetic mistake that we cannot change, but it's also not your fault. Um, but there's definitely an association with age. Um, there's been recent studies that show that if you have an increasing number of early miscarriages, um, you're more likely to be losing pregnancies that are um, embryologically and genetically normal. And that gives me lots of energy because it means that um, in women who have had multiple miscarriages, um, there is a chance that intervention from a scientific basis or from a clinical basis can change the outcome for that pregnancy. But we need to be able to identify which pregnancies are these that are genetically normal. And we need to have good interventions to change the eventual pregnancy outcome in these pregnancies. So in the past, we very much relied on animal models to know um, when women were pregnant. So this is a um, pregnancy test from the 50s. But at the moment, there's lots of surveillance in early pregnancy. So I think especially couples who have been through pregnancy complications and lost, they often have lost that naivety of, of an unplanned pregnancy. So lots of times couples will know exactly when they ovulate, they'll know when um, they conceive, they, they'll know when they're pregnant even before they've missed their next period. Um, and on the NHS, if everything is going well, your first scan will be at 11 to 13 weeks when you have um, a dating scan and you have a genetic screening as lots of women will know. Um, but again, from a clinical point of view and from a research point of view, that also energizes us because it means that there's a lot of time where women know that they're pregnant, where we can reassure them, we can care for them, um, we can screen for different complications, and hopefully in the future we'll have lots of interventions available to change the early pregnancy outcome. Um, this slide is just a quick slide to say that actually it's also important to realize that there are um, harms that we can do as doctors. So I think a lot of us know that uh, when you present to hospital, there's also there's always a chance of things going wrong, of people getting the wrong diagnoses. Um, and this study by um, Cecilia Bottomley showed that if you have a scan before five weeks of pregnancy, the most likely outcome would be that of a pregnancy of unknown location. So the sonographer or the doctor will scan you and they'll say, we have no idea what your pregnancy is. It's probably too early. But in those women, there is a small chance of them having an ectopic pregnancy, or even if the pregnancy is in the right place, not being a normal pregnancy. So it's very difficult to reassure women. And often women at that stage will go on this long pathway of having lots of blood tests and surveillance. And I know from seeing lots of women in this situation, um, the anxiety can actually be much more by having too much intervention in the first trimester. Um, but if you have a scan, after six weeks of pregnancy with um, a very regular cycle and sure menstrual dates, most women will have a very normal viable pregnancy on, on scan. Um, and that's why a lot of people will say to you, wait until six or seven weeks before you have a scan if you've got no symptoms, um, because that, that may actually increase the, um, the stress in, in the management of your first trimester pregnancy. Um, women do present though with bleeding. And I think a lot of women that have experienced um, any pregnancy complications and pregnancy loss, it's like Marge's experience. Uh, bleeding is an extremely um, emotive symptom to have. It's extremely scary. Women with recurrent miscarriage talk about checking their pads very regular for the sight of, of blood. The reality is that um, a bit of bleeding in the first trimester is unlikely to increase your risk of having a miscarriage. Um, we sometimes talk about this idea of an implantation bleed that can happen very early on. Um, but if you have very heavy bleeding in the first trimester, your risk of having a miscarriage definitely increases. Um, 
and like Marge described as well, um, bleeding in the first trimester can be a risk factor for later pregnancy complications. So it's second trimester pregnancy loss or, or preterm birth. Um, the reason I've spoken about bleeding here as well is it brings me on nicely to a recent intervention that we've started using in early pregnancy, and that's that of progesterone. Now, progesterone has been around for a very, very long time, and um, we give it to women as a vaginal or erectile preparation. Um, but in the last couple of years, there's been two very big studies that are very well designed. Um, so there was the PROMISE trial and the PRISM trial. And these are two trials that are randomized control trials with a placebo. So you're comparing a group of women that are selected very randomly um, and you give them a placebo and you select another random group and you give them the intervention, which in this case was progesterone. Um, and it was double blinded it means that um, the researchers nor the patient knew if they were having placebo or um, or progesterone, and there were big numbers. So um, it was about four thousand patients recruited in, in one study, and about two thousand in the other. Um, and so this is the best quality data that you can you can have of randomized placebo control trial. And what this study showed was um, in women with bleeding that had progesterone, there was no difference in the live birth rate, um, but well, I say no difference, there was no significant difference, but um, women who had progesterone did have slightly higher um, rates of having a live birth, but then it did not reach a statistical significance. And similarly, in the group of women who were studied with recurrent miscarriage, um, when they just looked at the numbers, there, there, there was no significant difference. Um, but the authors um, did a post hoc subgroup analysis, which they um, plan to do even prior to um, doing the analysis and they found that um, in women who have had multiple previous miscarriages and who were bleeding progesterone may um, favor live birth outcome um, and so this has changed local guidance recently where uh, we recommend that if women have had um, recurrent miscarriages and they're bleeding that in this group of women progesterone might make a difference and like i showed you earlier um, we think that women who are having recurrent miscarriages are more likely to be losing genetically normal pregnancies and therefore it's, it's worth intervening um, in these pregnancies and trying to make a difference the same authors of this study was also involved in the recent Lancet series on miscarriage, which was titled Miscarriage Matters. Um, and they actually said overall, there's no high quality evidence, though, um, that there's any intervention in the first trimester that can change the outcome for women who are high risk of miscarriage. So progesterone, we've discussed, um, there's some data on screening for anti for lipid syndrome and blood thinners in, in that group of women, um, and thyroxine for women who have subclinical um, hypothyroidism. Um, but we still don't have high quality um, evidence. And I, I think it's probably because we're not able to stratify the different types of pregnancy losses, because there's different miscarriages is a pregnancy outcome. So there's different causes um, that uh, result in miscarriage for, for different patients. Um, but this brings me on to something that I can talk about for hours, and I, I know that I'm already over my time, but um, the vaginal microbiome is a very interesting um, theme that a lot of researchers are looking at at the moment in the context of pregnancy. Um, it has been shown to be associated with preterm birth. So having low levels of lactobacillus in the vaginal microbiome and having lots of different types of bugs can increase the risk of um, preterm birth. Um, probably because it allows um, bad bacteria to um, to kind of be promoted, um, and also because it uh, it doesn't it's quite inflammatory, so you, you don't have um, an anti-inflammatory environment. We know that in miscarriage, there's a group of women that will miscarry because of infection. Uh, and we've shown um, about a year ago that in a group of women who were having a miscarriage, um, their levels of lactobacillus uh, in the vaginal microbiome was much less. So they had um, a worse um, kind of vaginal makeup compared to women who have had a, um, a normal pregnancy. And there's lots more research that we're doing at the moment in order to understand this association better. Um, there's other fields of research that my colleagues are doing specifically at, at Warwick and, and Birmingham. Um, so there's a lot of talk about um, the perfect time of embryo implantation, the selectivity of the endometrium for, um, for the right embryo. Um, and there's a lot of work to look at how the stem cells and endometrium assist that, that process. Um, we're also looking um, as a kind of scientific group at, at um, the sperm. So we know that if you have increased sperm DNA fragmentation, this might associate with infertility and miscarriage. 
And cell free fetal DNA is something else that I'm very excited about because um, we may be able to identify very early in the future which pregnancies are genetically normal and which ones are abnormal. And it's those ones that are um, normal where, where um, intense medical intervention might make a difference. That was a very quick overview, um, um, but I think the, the conclusion is that there's, there's lots of room for, for answering more questions about miscarriage and, and hopefully for making a difference um, for couples. Thank you, Hanine. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I've got lots of questions, but uh, I'd love to encourage um, anyone who, who is in the room to submit a question through the chat um, or raise a hand. Um, Hanine, I'd love to sort of unpick this idea a bit about um, the idea that most miscarriages are unpreventable and what, what's your view on that? Yeah, it's, it's um, an interesting idea, which I think a, a lot of doctors learn from an early stage of our training. So we learn that up to 60% of pregnancies will miscarry because there's abnormal chromosomes in that pregnancy that happens by chance. And there's nothing that we as doctors can do to change the genetic makeup of that pregnancy. Um, it's not the, the couple's fault. There's nothing that they did to, to cause that outcome. Um, and so that's why a lot of people, when they um, look after women and couples with, with pregnancy loss, they are very reassuring. They say, don't worry, it's nature's way of, um, uh, of managing your, your abnormal pregnancy. Keep trying, um, there's, there's lots of hope. Um, so I, I do agree, yes, uh, a big proportion of pregnancies that um, end in the early first trimester are, are not preventable, um, but it doesn't mean that, that those women um, shouldn't receive care. And I really hope that in the future, we are able to stratify early on which pregnancies are um, genetically abnormal um, and will unfortunately be lost. And Anna, can I, can I bring you in? Um, what advice would you give for somebody who has suffered a miscarriage and you know, what, what can they expect? What's reasonable to expect from their health practitioner? Hi everyone. Um, I think really we need a paradigm shift in the way that we start thinking about miscarriage now and the fact that we have thought, you know, for a long time that it is just one of those things. You know, now with Tommy's um, National Centre for Miscarriage Research, we've got this information that's just come out very, very recently in the Lancet series on miscarriage and it's telling us that actually it, it, it isn't. So I think there are those modifiable risk factors that we can, you know, do something about. So, you know, going into pregnancy with a with their healthy body mass index, um, you know, smoking cessation, our diet, you know, are there things that we can change, you know, in, re in relation to stress, um, the way that we're working, so night shift patterns, that kind of thing is a, is a difference. But I think um, certainly the researchers are talking about um, each time that somebody miscarriages, uh, miscarries, there is that opportunity to look at their health and evaluate so to talk about those things um, prior to you know going on to have a, a subsequent pregnancy and because we know that one in three you know um, women will, will get pregnant within a month you know there's there is time to to start you know getting that health uh, education and preconceptual care in at that stage so I think certainly seeing your GP um, is, is, is definitely a good idea, you know, if you're thinking about um, going on to, to, to try to get pregnant again, um, you know, your mental health and your physical health, thinking about having, you know, starting on folic acid um, are all things that you can start doing. And, you know, it's not just about trying again. And I think, you know, the Lancet series talks about that era is gone now. You know, we need to be thinking that each time, you know, this sadly happens to, to a couple, you know, there are things that we can do each time. And just like Hanine was saying with progesterone in a subsequent pregnancy with early bleeding. So, you know, that people don't feel that there is just, um, you know, it's just one of those things and, and you just have to kind of, you know, carry on. 